Okay, very welcome everybody to this cafe talk, uh, in the seventh cycle that we've had since uh, last autumn. Uh, every cycle has its own, policy, uh, own uh, theme, and this time it's about policy recommendations for rural areas dynamism. And uh, Rubismo, as you might know, is a project which is coming close to its end. We will finalize the project in uh, October. We hope to live on because many of our tools are really relevant for uh, rural business modeling, rural business development. We've been working in three sectors. We've had some uh, and launched the website rubismo.eu where you can find um, um, a virtual library of if different examples and you can find tools for, uh, for business development. And today we have invited uh, a speaker for, uh, for, uh, to talk about support schemes uh, and encouraging um, uh, farmers. And I know Jenny, she's a PhD from our own university, SLU, uh, and she's now working on, well, with business development, I would say, to cut it short. But I leave the floor to you, Jenny. And uh, then uh, if you want to ask questions, uh, you can ask them in the chat and we'll bring them up to Jenny as, uh, as we go along. Jenny, please. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me to this, uh, this moment. Uh, can you see my, my screen right now? Yeah, good. Yes, I was actually a PhD at uh, Halmstad University within innovation science, and I defended my thesis a year ago. Um, it was in, within the innovation science and within entrepreneurship and, and rural entrepreneurship. So I'm going to tell you about some of my results and some of my thoughts about how we can work, we in this support system, everyone who works with helping and supporting and, and pushing the rural development in different ways. How can we work to support innovation and value creation for rural development? And when I talk about my, my research, I talk about farmers, but, but you can always think of other rural entrepreneurs. It doesn't have to be farmers that this is uh, applicable to. So this was my uh, doctoral thesis. It was uh, entitled Value Creation for Sustainable Rural Development, Perspectives of Entrepreneurship in Agriculture. So I looked at how to create value for sustainable rural development. And I looked at different perspectives of entrepreneurship in agriculture both the individual, the farmer perspective, the business perspective and the system perspective, which I'm gonna talk about today. And when I talk about support system, I, need, I mean support equal to help, to, to not only money, but help uh, such as um, counseling, such as programs, uh, such as education and so on. So this kind of help is uh, what I talk about when I say the support system. And in my thesis, I included 130 farmers in different ways in interviews and observations and so on. And 30 different um, organizations, actors in these support systems. And that could be organizations such as uh, counseling organizations or, or governmental organizations or uh, member organizations, uh, such as, for example, the, the Federation of, of Farmers in, in Sweden. I conducted 22 interviews and 16 observations. And I observed meetings where they were talking about problems and how to solve different pro problems and so on in the system. Both meetings between the farmers and, and people in the support system and, and uh, only uh, actors in the support system and only farmers as well. And everything, every interview and observations was recorded and it was 78 hours recorded material which, which was transcribed afterwards. So this is the basic of what, what I'm gonna talk about. And when I did my first study in my process, I looked at what was hindering um, farmers to develop sustainable business models. I looked at barriers to sustainable business model innovation. And then I'm going to share three quotes with you because it wasn't just three quotes. It was every farmer that I talked to had the same picture. And that made me think a bit about the support system. Here is one. I'm thinking of all the advisory organizations where some parts are pretty restricted. If this study can be a help to improve the service given the situation, the poor competition, I welcome it. 
since I entered this industry, it really is like Sahara to be able to turn elsewhere, even if we could do it with the small private advisors who are really passionate about what they do, we are happy to pay more for it. We don't want to spend money on an outdated behavior and old knowledge. We have been doing it for four years, but now it's over. Further, the competition has increased on feed purchase, etc., where the Danes came in and we thought that the other would follow, but these are large organizations with a lot of overhead costs, and then you don't keep up. Then we prefer a smaller player. Another one said, I've been a bit, uh, I would not say skeptical, but questioning the advisory organizations. Sometimes it feels like you just want to sell advice in order to sell advice and you haven't an overall view. The financial advisor doesn't talk to the feed advisor, which in turn doesn't speak with the cultivation advisor and so on. And a third said, advice organizations are slowing down the development. If I hadn't listened to them, I had progressed much further. They are ignorant and come here to learn. They have trimmed a crazy system. They may just have hindered us. That's my conclusion of the whole. I haven't hired counselors in eternity and there are numerous of them. It's fucking tragic. They have cheated the farmers because they haven't needed to take responsibility for anything. When shit happened, they just disappeared and said, it was a shame that it went that way. At that time, <laughs> during my PhD time, I was working in, the, in one of these advisory organizations, being an industrial PhD. So of course I was reacting when they talk about this. I, I didn't ask them anything about the advisory organizations during my interviews, but they talked about this and I, I had to dig deeper in the support system and in the advisory system, which is rather huge in Sweden. And of course there was a need for change, both in the way of looking at the farmer and agricultural businesses and in working methods within the support system. Here are two ads from, from uh, the Swedish Farmer Association. It, it's in Swedish, but it says, uh, thank a farmer for the food for midsummer. It shows uh, that farmers are food producers. And the other one says, for t um, 12 years ago, I saw uh, both of the sides of the road looked the same, but then the, um, the animals stopped grease on the one side. So they talk about farmers being food producers and someone to keep the landscape open. That is the role of farmers. And that is the view in society, in the uh, farmer member organizations and in research. Actually, the, the farmers wasn't included in the entrepreneurship research at all because farmers are not entrepreneurial, uh, are not considered entrepreneurial in research before. So I, I saw that there were other roles and, and other values that the farmers created for the countryside, for rural development, other roles that then food producer and taking care of the nature. They were also enablers for entrepreneurship in the countryside, and they were workers for society in the countryside. They did a lot of job that was very, very valuable for, for rural development, but that was taken for granted and that was hidden. This is one example of uh, a couple from moving here from London, actually, to, to the countryside in Sweden, Janet and Robert. They bought a, a house, they, they opened a bed and breakfast, a, a restaurant, they had these tourism events and so on. But they didn't have the land, they didn't have the animals, they, they had someone to take care of the surroundings, they had a farmer to take care of the surroundings, they had a farmer to put some sweet highland cactus that could look into the restaurant window so, so the, the guests were happy. Um, the farmer who provided services, machines and so on. And this is the way it is in the countryside. The farmers do a lot of things to help other entrepreneurs to develop their entrepreneurship as well. And another example is people, at least in Sweden, we have this way, when, when the students graduate from school, we take for granted that we can call a farmer to come with a tractor and the wagon and, and drive the students. Or when it's winter and snow, we, we call the farmer who come and plow the roads in the countryside. Or as in 2018, in the summer, do you remember what happened in the summer 2018? When I conducted, it was during my PhD process and I had the opportunity to study farmers during this huge pressure when they had this strain and so on. Then they left their, their homes and their farms and they helped to light or to extinguish the forest fires instead in Sweden. They left their own companies to help in society in the forests. 
And they also, of course, maintain roads and so on. So they do a lot of things working for the rural societies, which we just take for granted, and which, of course, affects their business model innovation and their business businesses um, in different ways, because they, they don't always prioritize their economic business or their economic sustainability in the business, um, the first. So if we conduct some insights from my research about the system, there is a gap between the support which is provided between what the, th uh, the farmers uh, experience as support and, and what we think, we who work in the support system, we think we, we provide support, we want to help, but there is a gap about what they experience and what we provide. And it's important to understand the mechanisms that affect entrepreneurship in agriculture, both for the farmers themselves and for the actors in the support system. And there are two different mechanisms that are very important to understand and it's the sustainability. Sustainability for farmers is not the ordinary uh, sustainability description that we think that ordinary entrepreneurs uh, uh, appreciate and so on. Because for farmers, sustainability is very, very, very long term. They have inherited their farm from several generations and they plan to leave for several generations ahead. So sustainability for them, for them is very, very long term. And there is also one thing that when, when I looked at what, how do they prioritize the different perspe sustainability perspectives, they prioritized the social sustainability as the first. Second was the environmental and third, the economic sustainability. Because the social sustainability, the social, the, the social relations and so on, they, ha they have to do with the embeddedness, embeddedness in the area. Embeddedness is a, perhaps you, you know the, uh, how we talk about embeddedness in entrepreneurship re research. We are embedded in the rural area. We have common cultures, we have common rules, we have common intentions, we, we, um, we have relations with several gener generations back and we know each other's neighbors and, and other people work, you know, working and living in the area. We behave in certain ways and we don't behave in certain ways. So this embeddedness affects the farmers' decision-making in their businesses. Sometimes they take decisions which are crazy if we look at the economic sustainability, but they provide the social sustainability because they are embedded. They take care of, they take a, a decision which is good for the community or for the neighbors and, and for, or for someone else, but not for the economic sustainability of the business. So this embeddedness and sustainability really, really affects farmers' business models innovation. And we need to be brave and, and um, open to see, understand the current situation. This is the way it looks in agriculture today. This is the way it looks in the Swedish support system today then we can develop, then we can be able to develop. But we can't, if we, if we think it's very good, we provide the best services and we, we support them in, in good ways and so on. If we don't dare to see this gap, then we can't develop in the right way. And the thesis also illustrates how policies based on economic growth strategies, which almost all our policies are, they overlook significant values and aspects of rural entrepreneurship and rural development. Because if we just base our policies and our working methods and so on on economic growth strategies, then we, we can't see this embeddedness and this sustainability, the social sustainability prioritized. So we, we have to reconsider how we, how we do our policies and perhaps not base them always on economic growth. So what can we do? We can prioritize customer value. We can always think when we work in this support system, how, what value do I provide for my customer? If I do this, does this provide any value for my customer? If not, why do I do this? And we can collaborate across borders, both competence borders and organizations. In the Swedish support system, we work in I don't know the English word for Stuttgart. 
Who must you know? Silos. Uh, <laughs> pipes. I wouldn't know. But yeah. uh, Brenda, what, what is the word for working in, in uh, straight, no with no contacts? So competence is working. Even if we are in the same uh -huh. organizations, we work. I work in my competences. My colleagues will exactly the same competences, just like in the academy. So, so, uh, so that's no different, but we have to work between competences and between organizations. If we are different actors in the support system, we can't see each other as uh, competitors. We have to be colleagues instead of working for the farmers, of course, or for rural areas or whoever our customers are. And we need to understand that it's good. It's very, very valuable to, to see things from different perspectives. We have to work with the other uh, silo. <laughs> we can't just have our own perspective. And I am a, I'm an economist from the beginning, so, so I can't just look at the business model. Now I, we have to develop sustainable business models working with economic growth. I have to understand the different other perspectives as well. And this embeddedness. I think this embeddedness, understanding this is the key, actually. I know you're Brendan from from Ireland, wasn't it? Where where in in both Scotland and Ireland, so you you are very very good at this embeddedness, and you are very very embedded in the pub culture and and so on. So I've been very inspired from from research from from Scotland and Ireland. And we need to integrate research into advisory practice. We have so much good research, but the reason research doesn't get out to the farmers and to the practice. We don't have to, to invent the wheel over and over again. We, we can integrate, we can work tighter together between competences and organizations. So, so we get out with the research into the practice. And we, we have to make sure that we work with this continuous competence development and, and see competence development in the, as a long term, in the long-term perspective, because otherwise the farmers won't be satisfied. They are so very um, enlightened today and they are so good. So, so they need something more than the previous old support system than the old advisor organizations provided. And we can work with open innovation and agile working methods. And I'm gonna talk about open innovation in a while. And to be able to work with open innovation, we need to change our working methods and, and working with agile working methods it one, is one way. I think it's a good way to work with. Agile means, you know, agility, being flexible, easy, easy to move, um, work with custom orientation instead of, of own orientation, work with to create inner motivation for people working in the support system instead of re reward systems as in the academic world, <laughs> where you have these reward systems with the publications, um, for example, or, and work with confidence instead of scrutiny to get thing done, um, work done correctly or so on. And, and we, can, we also have to work with quick adjustments, this agile, this flexible, this fast moving uh, method, quick adjustments instead of planning years ahead. We are very good at planning uh, projects uh, three or five years ahead and planning in details, saying that we this year we will do this and, and next year we will do this, etc. But as we know, and as last year has showed us, something can happen in the society. The society can change very, very fast and we need to be flexible to, to move according to the society. This is Josef Schumpeter. He is the innovation, the father of innovation science. He already 1912 wrote about innovation. So innovation is nothing new. Uh, he said that innovation can take place either by further developing and improving something that already exists or by not resembling something that has existed before. So innovation can be small, incremental changes, development or big radical developments as well. And he said this, we always plan too much and think too little. How do we work today? How much time do we spend on planning our projects? And how much time do we spend on thinking, reflecting, learning what we have done? He said this 1912. These are different innovation models and how they have developed 
during the time. In 1950s, 60s, we thought that innovation was a linear process. It started with research and development that innovated something and pushed it out to the market. And then in the 70s, we turned it the other way around, starting with the market asking for something. And then in the 80s and 90s, we, we understood that we needed to, it's not a linear process and, and we need different competence and, and research and development, sometimes market, sometimes and so on, we started to understand that we need to work with networks, perhaps not only people in our own organization, perhaps other links outside in our network and so on. And since 2000, we have this innovation, open innovation concept, 2000, 20 years ago, this concept was established. And it's about, uh, I'm going to talk about it here. I can show you. Open innovation is, is just like you said, open, opening up, closed innovation as it was before. Then we had the innovation process within the company, within the organization. organization. But open innovation opens up talking to different markets, external competences and so on outside our own organization. And Shespera said that open innovation is the use of purposive inflows and outflows of knowledge to accelerate internal innovation and expand the market for external use of innovation, respectively. Another way of defining open innovation is companies develop cheap and better ideas from the best sources in the world through collabora collaboration with people outside their own organizations, including customers, resellers, and even competitors. So the purpose with open innovation is to gain input to their own work and pass on ideas to other actors who can take them from being an innovation, in invention to innovation. Because it doesn't matter how good ideas we have within our own organization. If, if we don't take them to the market, we, if we don't do them to innovations, they stay without, within our own organization and, and won't be used, then it's just an invention. If we have very, very good, good ideas and if we won't use them, we leave them on to someone else and they can do an invention. They can take them to the market, then it's an innovation. So the Swedish support system is here today. 60, 70, 80, perhaps a bit 90, not in the 2000 not 2021. So we have a lot of things to work with in the Swedish support system. And my last picture will be this, some learnings from what I've been talking about today. What do we learn from this? Remember the embeddedness. Think of how people, how entrepreneurs, how, how people who are active in the, in the countryside, how are they embedded? How am I embedded in my own organization, in my own values in my, in my own culture? What decisions do I take because of I'm embedded? Am I blind to something perhaps? And the sustainability. Remember how the farmers look at sustainability. Sustainability for them, economic sustainability for them is to be able to leave to coming generations, leave the business to coming generation. It's not economic sustainability for them. It's not being rich and famous and selling my business. It's being able to leave over to coming generations. They prioritize social sustainability the first. And the value creation. Who do I provide value for? Who is providing value for this area? Remember the farmers value creation, so much value they create and provide for the rural area, which we don't see in the rural area and which we don't evaluate. And open innovation. How can we work across borders, cooperate together, different perspectives and so on. And these agile working methods, how can we be fast enough? How can we um, adapt to, to the society when changes happen, when, when um, yeah, changes happen in society, changes happen in the farmer's business or whoever my customer is, how can I adapt to that? And how can we work with self-leadership, taking care of, looking for that I'm motivated, I take 
responsibility for my work. I don't have to be controlled. I don't have to report everything. I do what I should do. Then we can work with these agile working methods. And learning. Remember what Schumpeter said. We always plan too much and think too little. What can we learn? Do we reflect enough? Do we work with learning from all our projects and all our processes, everything we do? What can we learn? And I love this learning concept and, and I try to work with this mindset in everything I do. How can I learn? And sometimes, of course, I'm, I'm attending meetings where I think uh, this was nothing new for me. I knew everything and so on. But then I have a picture in my mind, which reminds me of I, every, I always can learn something. And it's this picture. A fool learns nothing from a wise man, but a wise man learns even from a fool. And I have this picture in my mind, and I think it's very useful for me.